This series focuses on effective leadership to create positive change in public health. And today we are very happy to welcome Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Mayor Bottoms is the 60th mayor of Atlanta. She's a native of the city and the first mayor in Atlanta's history to have served in all three branches of government. She was a judge, a member of the city council before being sworn in as mayor. And she has demonstrated what it means to be a leader during these times, time of the COVID-19 pandemic, the response to the murder of Mr. George Floyd. And today we're going to be discussing the mayor's effort to work to confront COVID-19 and the systemic racism that has also been uh, uncovered if we needed it to be by COVID-19. And at the same time, she has her usual job of being the everyday mayor of the great city of Atlanta. So Mayor Keisha uh, Lance Bottoms, it is a real pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you so much. It is truly an honor to join you today. Well, you know, I, I have to start out with um, reflecting on just these last days uh, and when we've had all eyes on Georgia uh, as the uh, Georgia moved into the column for the president elect Joe Biden. Of course, there will be a recount, uh, but it looks like the state of Georgia has flipped as they say. I wonder if you could reflect on the role of Atlanta in, uh, in making this shift. I don't, I don't know how long it's been since Georgia has gone for um, a Democrat in a presidential election. Could you just reflect on that a bit? Well, it, it's been, uh, 1992 was the last time. So it's been a very long time since we have gone with a Democrat for president and we have a huge demographic shift that's happening across Georgia. We are trending younger. We are trending as a more diverse state uh, with the help of motor voter registration, about 800,000 new voters have been placed on the voter rolls in the past several years. And so it is just really this, this coming together, this perfect storm um, that's brought us to this moment and when Vice President Biden, now President-elect Biden, was in Georgia towards the end of the campaign, you certainly could see that the campaign believed that Georgia could flip because we had uh, Vice President Biden here, we had Senator Kamala Harris, and we had President Barack Obama here. But I wore a shirt that said Atlanta influences everything. <laughs> and it's, you know, Everybody has their motto, but um, usually it's in, in reference to some type of, of cultural influence that we have in this city. But I truly believed and I knew that this year would be different because there was the, the, the voting rolls reflected that it, our, our state could go blue. Now we still have an uphill battle with the two Senate races, um, with the runoffs in those Senate races. It's not going to be easy, but I think with the momentum and the excitement and the attention that the voters have gotten across this state, I think turnout is going to be less of a challenge than it, it normally is, but it's still, uh, it's, there's still so much work to be done. But as of today, we're celebrating being blue. Right. Well, I, I uh, know that there's trending in Twitter sphere uh, an image of you, Stacey Abrams, and Vice President-elect uh, Kamala Harris, uh, and a tribute to the historically Black uh, colleges and universities of which you're all three a product. So, uh, you know, I, I want to just note that you personally have had something to do uh, with the with the turnout and with the result that we're seeing in, in the state of Georgia. But of course, this virus um, will still be here. It, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't pay attention to electoral cycles. Uh, can you just tell us how things are going with COVID-19 in Atlanta? So, uh, you know, the, the, this is a great day to talk about this. My, my son and, and the 
context of the election asked if we would all be going to the inauguration. And I stopped for a moment. I said, you know, I, I don't know if there's going to be an inauguration. I, I, I don't know what that's going to look like. Certainly, I suspect it will not be uh, the type that we normally participate in, but it, but it really highlights that this virus is still very, very real. And what we're seeing in Georgia right now is not a good trend. We were trending downward and it really, a downward trend came on the heels of the fight, the very public battle that I had with the governor of our state regarding a mask mandate. And although that was um, not a fight that it, nobody, no mayor wants to fight with their governor, I do think it was an opportunity to continue to educate and speak to the public about wearing masks. We saw our numbers trending downward for a while. Our numbers, like the rest of the country, are ticking back up. And it concerns me. Obviously, as we're going into uh, flu and cold season, I had a fever a couple of weeks ago. My son had one last week. My husband had one the other day. Not COVID, um, but this reminder that their, their viruses are still being transmitted. And it, it really worries me that we're still looking at tens of thousands of people um, who may die over the next several months unless we change our behavior and our patterns significantly across this state and across this country. Right, well, leadership is a really key role in that. And, and I, I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit more over the summer as you referenced just now, I think it was in July. Um, you effectively defied your governor and issued a mask mandate for the city of Atlanta. And he uh, responded by uh, not just threatening, but actually proceeding, I believe, to, to sue um, the city for taking this action, uh, which he believes should be totally voluntary, I guess. I, or is he against masks? Well, the, the irony of it was he sued me personally and our city uh -huh. council personally. He didn't sue the city and, and uh, uh -huh. Mayor Van Johnson in Savannah had put into place a mask mandate before Atlanta, Athens, Clark County, the governor's hometown. So it was, the, it, it was a very interesting timing and just a very um, interesting way in which he opted to pursue the, this legal action, but um, he is in favor of mask. Oh. Uh, and that was, again, the irony of this. At that time, he was traveling around the state encouraging people to wear masks, but yet he did not want us to have the ability to mandate it in our respective cities. So I, you know, I, I, given a lot of thought as to what that possibly could be about it, it still doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. He ended up dropping the lawsuit, but again, the silver lining, people mm -hmm. heard us repeatedly yeah. talking about masks yeah. and uh, uh, I think more people are wearing masks now than they were before. Is that right? And I was just looking around on the internet to see if I could find any data on it, but that's your impression that mask wearing went up, just having it in, in, in the news and the debate about it. In Massachusetts, the governor has issued a mandate uh, for everybody age five and over to wear masks at all times when outdoors. So that's in response to the ticking up of the number of cases. Uh, where, uh, it, as you say, it's going up everywhere, and uh, and the state of Massachusetts is uh, has a statewide increases now. So, uh, what what are you thinking? Will you'll do next? Just hold steady as she goes, continuing to uh, use the techniques that you've put in place already. The mandate for masks, testing. You've done more testing, I believe, in the state of Massachusetts when I was looking at, at the data, but your positivity rate is, is high, at least in the state. It, it, it is high. And what I know, the COVID-19 fatigue, the quarantine fatigue, it, it's very real. I was um, at an event, an outdoor event recently, and I'd spoken on stage, had my mask on, came off of the stage and it wasn't until, you know, a couple of minutes into a conversation, I realized that I was 
speaking to someone without having put my mask back on. So mm -hmm. it's this reminder to me how quickly we go back into these habits that have been a part of our entire lives and that's not wearing a mask. Right. We've got to continue to educate people and remind people we're doing across the city what we call a, um, a mask up campaign and just constantly pushing out the messaging, reminding people to keep their mask on, continue with the hygiene that we've encouraged people to follow. And then in the city of Atlanta, we're still in technically phase two of our reopening phase. We did things again, very differently than the governor. We had an advisory task force that gave us some recommendations on our phase reopening. So we still aren't issuing uh, permits right now for large gatherings. We're still, our city facilities are still closed. Um, that's not applicable to our schools. That's a, a separately run entity, but our school system is still closed in the city of Atlanta. So we're still doing everything possible um, that we can and just making recommendations and educating people on how we can get to the other side of this pandemic. And obviously a big concern of that is the economic e right. impact, which we're yeah. certainly thoughtful of, but our belief is we're not gonna ever get to a full economic recovery unless we take a step back and just really exercise um, thoughtfulness as it relates to COVID-19. Yeah, we've got to get this virus uh, under control. But of course, uh, there has been a huge hit. And I was looking at some national data um, that suggested that 40% of minority-owned small businesses have gone under uh, during this time. I know Atlanta um, has always had, at least for me, the image of being sort of a mecca of Black entrepreneurship and um, and, and I know that, that you have many black owned small businesses. Can you just talk about the economic impact and how you are, you know, how you are looking to, to deal with it? Are you looking forward to the, the federal government now perhaps managing to come up with a stimulus package again or? Yeah, a, a stimulus package would be great. And I know that cities and states across the country need a stimulus as well because our budgets are taking significant hits. We suspended business license, late fees. Uh, we put a series of things into place even before the CARES Act kicked in. We uh, created a strength and beauty fund that's for our cosmetologists and barbers where they could receive $1,000 grant we put in a small business loan fund, a CREATL fund, which is for our creative industry. Uh, we suspended evictions for folk who are a part, who um, if, if they receive public support for housing in Atlanta, right. whether it be through our housing authority or Invest Atlanta, et cetera, we put in a moratorium on evictions. We suspended water payments. So, we did every single thing that we could think of that would help soften the blow, but there's still so much more to be done. And thankfully, unlike a lot of other cities, we've not had to do anything with our taxes. We've not had to lay off any employees. We've been able to repurpose a lot of our employees to help with our food deliveries. We began delivering food to students um, who weren't getting their breakfast at lunch and, and as they normally do to our seniors. So we've been able, thankfully, to do a lot, but there are so many mayors across the country who didn't have the resources to be able to do what we did and didn't receive their CARES Act funding directly. If you were a city under 500,000 in population, you didn't get that money directly. And we're watching people have to fight with their counties and their states just to get their fair oh, share. I didn't realize that. So it was then controlled at state level as opposed to going directly to cities. And, and, and at the county level. And I can yeah. tell you, Atlanta was the only city in Georgia that received that money directly. And those who did not receive it are really mm. having a very tough time right now. Mm. Well, of course, uh, we've had the COVID pandemic, we've had the economic fallout of, uh, of the pandemic, and we had over the summer uh, the uh, national and global 
uh, uh, expressions of outrage as people took to the streets in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. And uh, in Atlanta, you uh, really, uh, I think, uh, channeled people's anguish and hurt and also were so effective in, in making, a, a, a making clear that the damage that was being done to the city uh, was, was not going to take Atlanta where it needs to go. Uh, you said at a press conference, your opening words were, I am first a mother. Uh, Ken, this was a, a, a true display of leadership, I think. And I, I, I wonder, you know, when you reflect back on it, um, because of course it, it brought you into national view once again, um, how are you feeling about it? And how are you feeling about the fact that, of course, the problems uh, of, uh, of uh, violence against, uh, uh, against people of color, particularly African-Americans by police remains an issue. And, uh, and the COVID pandemic has uh, had such an unequal burden with excess mortality among Blacks and Latinos. Yeah, and what, what you heard was straight from the heart that night. Um, I didn't have any script. I, I went out really with the intention of giving the public an update on, on where we were. My 18-year-old son was in the room with me, and I, I looked at him, and the words just began to flow. And even in the context of this election, I'm, I'm reminded that these issues still exist. And there's still so much work to be done, but to watch the jubilation and excitement of my kids when the results were announced, there was just this relief and this joy that came over them. And while there's so much work to be done, looking at in their eyes, I see that they have hope that things can get better. Um, because there's been a lot of anxiety, even down to my, my 10 year old twins, just, anxiety about where we are as a country because they're, they come in the room when the news is on and of course they have their devices in front of them and they're getting information and content that we can't always control and it this is it's been a very heavy time for them so we, we're going to keep pushing forward in Atlanta in the true spirit of who we are who we've been called to be and that's what you heard me try and convey um, that night that this is a city who's been through tough times with even when the worst came to our city with the assassination of, of Dr. King, cities burned across America and Atlanta didn't. Um, that we faced it head on courageously um, and, and we were able to do things differently in this city and what I saw happening that night was just going to make us another headline. It wasn't my belief, and I still believe, it wasn't going to accomplish anything because in that moment, we were talking about the destruction and the balance. We weren't talking about George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery or Breonna Taylor or, or any of the injustices. We were just talking about the chaos. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded, though, that uh, Martin Luther King did say that riots are an expression of the unheard. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what we saw that night is that people wanted to be heard. Mm -hmm. And what I hope to convey, and I, I, I thought that I did, <laughs> um, you know, we hear you, we see you, it, it matters, but this is not the answer, which is part of the reason, again, looking at my 18 year old, though I can speak until I'm blue in the face. <laughs> sometimes there has to be a different voice. So, which is why T.I. And, and Killer Mike got the call and, and Bernice King and um, others came to join us that night. I didn't know if anybody in those streets would listen to me, but I, I suspected that if Killer Mike or T.I. said it, it might be received better. You, you got to tell me who they are. I'm embarrassed. My, oh, no, no. My they're, connection no, they're, they're two um, <laughs> very, very well-known hip-hop 
I okay. thought probably. <laughs> and they're Atlanta based. Yeah. They are both Atlanta based. Yeah. And they both spoke that evening. And I think a lot of people listened to them who, uh, uh, who probably weren't listening to me. Yeah. Now, in the middle of all of this, the, the contest or the interaction with the governor, the pandemic, the, the public uprisings in response to the um, police killing of George Floyd, uh, you launched a new initiative. Um, let's see, it's called the One Atlanta Initiative. And, uh, and so I, I, I know that it was planned uh, before um, before the pandemic struck and how are you feeling about it now uh, and your ability to go forward with the program with tackling the COVID-19 pandemic so central to all governance right now? So the One Atlanta um, theme has always been the central focus of our administration and it's about this equity conversation. Mm -hmm. on improving the lives of people throughout our communities who may not always have access to resources, may not even know those resources exist. And so it, what it really showed me is this need to have a plan mm -hmm. because there has been so much that could not have been scripted for this year from a pandemic mm -hmm. that we hadn't seen in a hundred years to social uprisings that we hadn't seen in this country in the last 50 years. If we had not been thoughtful about our plan and our agenda, we would be completely off track this year. But it's also shown me that there is, again, to quote Dr. King, this fierce urgency of now. Yeah. Our one Atlanta plan, very well thought out, um, a lot of work we've been getting done in the process of closing our city jail. We eliminated cash bail bonds and closed our detention center to ICE. So we were reimagining that. We were doing some work on police reform and our use of force policies. We were doing a lot, but in just a matter of a few days, we then had to rethink what do we have time to accomplish and what do we have to get out the door right now? And, um, you know, it's a difficult task, but our communities and we know that people across our cities aren't waiting on the long-term plan. They want to see some quick results. So we're working on both ends on that. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, uh, and all over, and I don't know about Atlanta specifically, people who are in detention have faced increased risk of COVID. Uh, all of the public health advice that we give can be very difficult to accomplish within uh, the setting of incarceration. So how, were, so you, how, how are you handling it? You, didn't, you don't have a city jail anymore? I'm amazed. So we, we still have the city jail, but okay. again, the, the timing was perfect um, to the extent you can have perfect timing for a right. pandemic. Uh, but because we had eliminated cash bail bonds, we were down to maybe 30 oh, inmates a night mm -hmm. in this 450,000 square foot facility. Mm -hmm. We also um, ended our relationship with ICE so we didn't have the mass incarceration in Atlanta in the way that we've seen it in other cities. So, or in, in the, with the city of Atlanta with our jail. So we've gone through this long-term planning process on now that we have closed this jail, how do we transform this and take what was once a center of mass incarceration in our city and turn it into a true community asset and something that's building up our community. So it, it's been a fascinating process to go through. Um, we're now almost at this, the phase where the physical transformation will begin, but this has been with the partnership of a, a bunch of community partners, including many people who were formerly incarcerated in that facility. Wow, well, that's extremely impressive. Uh, as, as you know, we are uh, expecting the Affordable Care Act to go before the Supreme Court this week, and uh, that could have a big impact on 
health insurance coverage in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I, uh, I, I, we don't know what the outcome will be, but of course it, it's a source of concern because of the conservative bias of, of the court. Uh, although on, uh, they have uh, let the Affordable Care Act stand previously. Um, are you thinking about how this might affect Atlanta? Um, how, you know, I don't know what tools you have at your disposal to, to, um, to mitigate against uh, the decision that would lead to more people lacking uh, health insurance. Of course, people have lost health insurance because they have lost their jobs and have employer-sponsored plans. Yeah, uh, we know it, it's going to be a significant hit to the people of Atlanta if it's struck down because there's so many people who rely on the Affordable Care Act. And especially being in a state where we've not had full Medicaid expansion, um, where there are rural hospitals closing across our state, people are already in desperate need of access to medical care and coverage. And so it's my hope that uh, we know this, the Senate, um, the composition of the Senate has not been fully determined yet, but it's my hope that whatever happens with the Supreme Court, if it does negatively impact the Affordable Care Act, that there is a fix available on the legislative side, but that remains to be seen, but I'm deeply concerned by this. Right, yeah, no, I, uh... I, I think everybody is really um, going to keep their eyes on the state of Georgia and these two Senate races that I think if they both were won by Democrats, we would have a tie in the Senate. Is that right? That's, so, that's absolutely correct. There right. would be a tie. So that, that means that, uh, that um, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris would be the tiebreaker. Um, and I, I mean, what, what, how are you feeling about um, the ability to kind of resurrect the notion of bipartisanship? You would think that during a pandemic uh, where you have a virus that really doesn't care uh, what you are as long as you're a warm body, uh, that it would be a time for for people to understand that we need to act based on evidence and not based on political beliefs. I think if anybody um, has a chance of navigating us in that direction is Joe Biden. And we've seen him do it over several decades and, and he's caught a lot of flack for it, for working across the aisle um, with people who had very extreme views, but he's mm -hmm. been able to do it successfully. and. Ironically, even in, in our state before uh, the governor and I parted ways on COVID, we had and, and still have in many areas a very good working re relationship across the aisle. I'm the mayor of a, a blue city mm -hmm. uh, and to, up until Tuesday would be considered a red state, but we have a Republican governor, we have a Republican controlled legislature and so it's possible. Um, I, I think it just takes having the right person at the head of our government to be able to navigate that. And I don't know of a better person than Joe Biden. Yeah, I spent many years in Southern Africa. I lived in a small country called Zimbabwe for nearly 20 years. And I was, some friends of mine from there sent a clip of him at a Senate hearing where he's grilling the then I think it was Secretary of State George Shultz uh, about the tepid sort of hands-off attitude of that administration to the apartheid government, and that you know that was 35 years ago. But I I, I suspect that um, that we still have that fiery a Joe Joe Biden uh, with us. Uh, he was saying, you know, we're for not for the South African government. We're for the people of South Africa. And uh, they're not represented in that government. So he was pretty outspoken. So. Yeah, I mean, and, and like he said, 35 years ago, for, I mean, 40, uh, 
years or however long. Um, yeah, actually, it must have been more than 35 years. I've missed, I'm, I'm, I'm misquoting it a bit. No, um, I mean, but I, 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 I think if, if there is a, a chance, this, this is the one to, to lead us um, through this. And so I'm hopeful. We are such a divided country in so many ways. And, and it certainly helps not having the president of the United States feed into that division. Right. Uh, yes. I mean, it's been, for somebody who works in public health, just so deeply troubling to see the haphazard response um, and the total fragmentation, uh, leaving it to states, to uh, local jurisdictions to navigate their way, uh, resulting in this patchwork of, uh, of a response that was so confusing to the public. We've squandered a lot of public trust. And uh, it's, it seems to me that you've been able to take some of these crises and use them as an opportunity to rebuild uh, or, or, and strengthen public trust in government. Uh, is it just your personality and your ability to marshal facts and um, your clear um, kind of projection of honesty and transparency? Or how, how, how can you attribute um, the, the fact that you've been able to navigate this blue city in a, a red state to a blue city in a blue state? Well, I, I wish that I could say it was some well thought out strategic plan, but uh, what I've learned in leadership, especially about myself, is the more exhausted you are, the more authentic you become. But you don't have you only have a finite amount of energy, and it takes it takes a lot to pretend. So, um, I, you know, I, I think what people have seen from me is it, just. It, it's who I am. It's, it's who my parents raised me to be. And I can't, as, as my mother often says to me, a little bit of common sense goes a long way. I, I'm not a public health official. I did very poorly in science. I'm, I'll just tell you. So I, I listen to the experts and, and the facts. And I have to also think, um, Dr. Carlos Del Rio from Emory University, who has just really been a, a guiding force for us in the city of Atlanta, just laying it out straight. These are the facts, this is the data, these are the trends. And, and just following that, and it's mind boggling to me that other people refuse to do that. I am not arrogant enough to think that I know everything about everything. And if there's something I know that I don't know a lot about, it, it's about science and um, medical recommendations. <laughs> so I just look to the experts and the facts and then I, I just relay it to the people in the way that I see it. Well, we have a question from a student, but maybe if we have a few minutes after the student gets to ask their, her question, um, we can come back and talk a little bit about your family. Um, here we are. Here is our student. Can you introduce yourself and ask your question? Mayor Bottoms and Professor Bassett, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it was truly inspiring to listen to this conversation today. Uh, my name is Amruta Dendaluri. Um, I'm a Master of Public Health student at Harvard Chan and logging in from India right now. My question for you is, as Dr. Bassett mentioned earlier as well, with much of the recent data highlighting that the Asian, Latino, Black, and immigrant communities are at disproportionate risk for infection and mortality from COVID-19, this pandemic appears to be drawing attention to some chronic societal failures at the crossroads of healthcare and social justice, such as exclusion and discrimination. 
From your experience, what are some tangible ways to strengthen the public health and social infrastructure to better serve these communities and provide equal access for testing, treatment, and eventually the vaccine? Well, thank you so much for the, the thoughtful question. Um, I'll tell you what we had done in Atlanta, which was really something I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased um, and I had no idea it would impact us in this way at this time. We aren't responsible for public health um, as an entity, as a municipality. The county is responsible, but we have some of the highest HIV and AIDS rates in the city. So we had hired a chief health officer to help us navigate those HIV AIDS rates, some of the systemic uh, health challenges that we see in communities of color, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, these things that while they may not come under our purview, they're impacting our communities and certainly should have our attention. The fact that we had this chief health officer in place during this pandemic has really been a godsend in so many ways. And it has really highlighted for us the need to not wait until a pandemic to address these systemic issues, because it's not necessarily the racial disparity as much as the disproportionate impact that these negative health challenges have on these um, communities of color. And so it has really highlighted for us the need to continue to address those challenges, whether it be making sure that people have access to healthy food, we, have um, really pushed forward on trying to eliminate the food desert that we see in our communities, making sure that people have access to health care, that there are health services and, and community serve, um, support and resources provided to them. And so that's what this pandemic, this pandemic has shown us that unless we address those systemic issues, Today, it may be COVID-19 and tomorrow it may be something else, but we know that these issues exist. And even when it's not technically your responsibility, it's certainly um, you owe an obligation to your communities to address these issues. And then just one last thing that we've been very thoughtful about in Atlanta, because we know that we have a large Hispanic population, even something as simple as making sure that our messaging is being translated um, to our to other communities throughout our city, to Spanish speaking communities in our city, um, also doing a lot of the work through our chief health officer, but also doing it through our welcoming Atlanta office, which is our office of immigrant affairs, making sure that we're meeting our communities at their point of need, assessing their needs, and then delivering the resources and support accordingly. Thank Thanks, you so Amrita. much for answering the question. Thank you. Thanks, Amrita. So I'm really glad that you point out that, you know, that these common conditions, which are really common, 60% of adults in the United States have a chronic disease of the most common being high blood pressure, but diabetes, obesity, these are really common conditions, but they do occur disproportionately, but not for genetic reasons, uh, related uh, more to, you know, to the opportunities for, um, for healthy eating, healthy exercise. But I also wonder if you could comment on the risk of exposure. Um, by that, I mean getting the risk of getting infected in the first place with COVID-19 related to crowded housing, which is particularly common in the Latino community, to working outside the home, which many essential low-wage workers had to continue to do. Um, uh, these also uh, seem uh, likely, I, I think it's indisputable, that they've been driving transmission in poor communities of color. Yeah, absolutely, because what we know is that many in our minority communities, especially our frontline essential workers, City of Atlanta, probably 50% of our workforce it was deemed essential. 60. 
uh, about 50%. 50 of our it's a little higher than nationwide, actually. Yeah. Well, and this is the city mm -hmm. of Atlanta as an entity, the municipality right. city of Atlanta. But we had, uh, we still, our sanitation workers still had to go out every day and be on a truck together. So it's not just when we're thinking about our firefighters and our police officers, we're thinking about our sanitation workers, our, our, the people who work in our watershed department. So there are a lot of blue collar, what we traditionally think of as blue collar workers who are considered essential. Again, thankfully in the city of Atlanta, we were able immediately to put in hazard pay for our city of Atlanta employees, really? $500 a month, um, which we are, we, I believe we're still continuing that. Um, and again, not that any dollar amount will save someone from COVID-19, but it certainly was our way of acknowledging that we recognize that you are going above and beyond in the midst of this pandemic to make sure that the rest of us have what we need. Um, but again, the congregate living, that's important. We set up housing for our, um, to send people um, when they needed to be quarantined, especially with our homeless population, making sure that we were, as we were all glued to our television sets, watching and watching on our laptops, getting the news, you gotta remember, many in our homeless population don't have access to that information. So we were going out on the street, making sure they had information in hand to educate them on COVID-19. And then to the extent that we had anyone who was infected, we were able to set up with the help of the state a quarantine hotel for our homeless population. And then giving them the, the resources and doing a true assessment while we had them there to make sure that we weren't just sending them back out to the street. So it's been really fascinating to watch how quickly we had to think through so many things but how quickly we were able to think through it. And I think in large part, a lot of the politics were removed from that discussion because we all had to work together for the same goal. And at that time, we were working very closely uh, with our state to make sure that we could get things up and running in the way we needed to. Wow. Well, we only have about five minutes remaining, but I, I wanted to... Um, I, I had two more questions. Let's hope that we can slip them both in. One is I've just come from a conversation with a bunch of people in New York, none of them currently in, in city government, many of them um, previously played roles in city government, about the importance of infrastructure, uh, about our, you know, the parks and the um, the, I, you know, the fact that some roadways have been turned into pedestrian plazas and the way in which the city, which is a very dense city, much denser, I, I'm, I'm sure, than Atlanta, has been reconfigured uh, to create more public space. So I, I'm wondering whether you're thinking at all, of, you know, all of us are hoping that as we recover, that we, that we don't just return, uh, but that we develop um, a pathway to a more equal society and, and one that is more invested in the notion that there should be public space that belongs to all of us. I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's given so many people across our communities appreciation for public space. A lot of people hadn't been out in our parks and hadn't been doing the simple things that we take for granted, like going out for a walk. Well, now people are home. Uh, they're out walking. They're out, I, I ordered some roller skates recently. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're all doing things that we haven't done in a very long time. And I hope that so much of it is sustained. And for as much as even with my family, I love to eat out. We aren't eating out as much, which means we've, we've lost a little weight around here and um, <laughs> we're having more family time together around the dinner table. So these little silver linings um, in, in what's been just very tragic circumstances. That's true. 
Well, we that's I think what we all need to have hope. We we've gotten some hope over the the weekend. And my last question was really turning back to talking about your childhood. Your your father was a a, a well known R and B singer who uh, ended up going to prison. And I was wondering, as you were talking about the um, the reforms that you've been able to to affect in Atlanta whether that experience of having a parent incarcerated, you know, affected your attitude towards the criminal justice system. And it, it shaped everything about me. Mm -hmm. And um, it really watching my father's incarceration and experiencing that as a child, you know, it's very easy to be judgmental about people's circumstances when you just look at it from the outside. But I know that our criminal justice system is full of men like my dad, who were just, my dad was a wonderful person, a good hearted person who made a very bad decision and a bad mistake. And, and the criminal justice system is full of people like that. And what I know about my dad's incarceration, I'm sure if there had been some other alternatives, if there had been some type of drug treatment program some type of alternative to address the underlying issues that led him um, to doing what he did, then the outcome would have been very different. So it, it shaped my childhood, it shaped who I am. I think it's given me uh, compassion and concern I otherwise wouldn't have. And, and while those um, resources weren't there for my dad, I. I truly, truly hope they'll be there for other little girls and their families. Well, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, it has been a true pleasure to have a chance to be in conversation with you. And I, I, uh, we're all lucky to have you, not only the city of Atlanta. And of course, uh, we uh, really appreciated having your thoughts. Um, I understand that we're going to be bringing more voices and leadership during crisis segments in the weeks ahead. So I hope everybody will stay tuned and, uh, and let's give a virtual round of applause to uh, Mayor Lance Bonhams. Thank you for joining Well, thank us you today. to both of you. It was an honor to join you both.